we'll see. <clears throat> Here, this is about where we left off in chapter four. Alice is stuck inside of a little house and she's growing and that house is quickly, it's too small for her. And I talked about how this could metaphorically, you know, or symbolize uh, this idea of her growing up and growing older into adolescence. And quickly, she's reaching the roof of that house um, <clears throat> and how that corresponds to how little children began to realize fairy tales, you know, uh, they, they start getting too big for fairy tales and Alice is literally getting too big for a fairy tale. What happens if I, you know, I, there's no room for me to grow up here anymore. When I grow up, I'll write a fairy tale, you know, but I'm growing up now, she says. Uh, <clears throat> but what if I'll never get any older than I, I am now? That'll be a comfort. I'll never be a woman. I'll never be an old woman like the Queen of Hearts or the Duchess who we are beginning to read about. But then I'll always have lessons to learn. So she'll get too old for fairy tales and have to read lessons like her sister does with no pictures and no conversations. And she laments that fact. Um, I remember kind of naively stating to a friend when I was starting to turn this age and saying, I, my friend was 13 and I was like, I had no conception of what 13 could be like, you know, being a teenager. And I was lamenting. I was like, but when I turn 13, I can't get a personal pan pizza or a happy meal anymore. You know, and I was like, uh, <clears throat> I remember saying that as a kid, you know, it was like, wow, that's the worst thing that can happen. And she's having some of these kinds of misunderstandings about what it's like to grow older. You know? um, but it's funny, you know especially towards us. Um, <clears throat> but she equates growing older with boring stuff. You know, being a young child is much more fun than growing older. So this is, you know, how, what we're learning about growing up and growing older and how kids perceive these kinds of things. Um, So I think that this is an important thing down at the bottom of this. This is chapter four again. Uh, and the name of this chapter is Rabbit Sends in a Little Bill. Look at how she's afraid of these animals that are about to set fire to a house. I no, because later on, when the Queen of Hearts threatens to chop off her head, she's not afraid at all. Uh, it's She says, why should I be afraid? They're nothing but a pack of cards. Uh, it's like one thing that she one way that she grows in this work or develops in this work is she begins to gain control over Wonderland. Um, here, she is quite forgetting that she's a thousand times as large as the rabbit and has no reason to be afraid of it. <laughs> I would be scared of burning alive as well, right? <laughs> uh, but of course, you know, it's a dream, right? She's in a dream. Um, and gradually she kind of comes to gain control over her dream to realize that she is the creator of that dream. Um, <clears throat> look at how she tries to manage to grow up again. So this is how in the mind of a little child, you know, how do we grow up? For Alice, it's I need to eat a little bit of something. If I eat some more stuff, then I'll get bigger. In Wonderland, that rule applies. Sorry, there's some blue on my thumb right here. I was uh, doing a painting project with Brooklyn. We were, uh, they were creating a flag for her Weebelows uh, den. Uh, it's a cute little flag. I'll show you a picture when she makes it. It's not finished yet. But anyway, I've got a lot of blue on my thumb here from that painting. Chapter five, I think, is a pretty important chapter. Uh, advice from a caterpillar. So this is, again, you know, a <clears throat> famous scene uh, right here. <laughs> she likes to eat her feelings. <laughs> That's funny, Bailey. Um, this is a famous scene right here. It, in the 60s, you know, they were talking about how he's, he's smoking hashish, perhaps. Um, 
and he's in the Tennille drawing. We had these little uh, mushroom caps down there, which very well could be psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, <clears throat> taking LSD, tripping out, perhaps the caterpillar is doing all of those things. And so the work speaks to, no matter how you interpret it, altered states of consciousness. So it's not just growing up and growing older. It could also speak to altered states of consciousness. So what is it like to be in an altered state of consciousness, either through drugs or through uh, being in a dream, being in kind of a dream world? And this caterpillar is certainly in an altered state of consciousness. Uh, <clears throat> and he says, who are you? Uh, so this is the question of identity. Uh, the work time and time again speaks to who are you? You know, if I ask you, who are you? You'll try to define yourself. You'll say by, think about how you try to define yourself. I'd try to say by my occupation. I'd try to say I'm a teacher or uh, I'd say, you know, I'm a 36 year old uh, Caucasian male who lives in America and speaks English. I would define myself by perhaps my religion or by uh, the way I look. You know, uh, <clears throat> but he says, who are you? And he forces Alice, you know, Alice says, I hardly know. Because she's changing all the time. So she doesn't know how to define herself right now because she's changing. And that's kind of like the experience of growing up and growing older. You change it. Or it could be like the experience of you know, taking a trip on a psilocybin mushroom. Uh, you know, once you do that, you don't see the world in the same way, perhaps. Uh, or, you know, getting getting drunk, going out in the cotton district and taking six shots in an hour. Uh, you certainly wouldn't feel the same way that you did an hour earlier. Um, <clears throat> so she doesn't feel herself, and that's very confusing to her, and it's frustrating. I think it's important to note the difference between the reader and Alice. So... When Lewis Carroll or Charles Dodson first told this story, he was telling this story to Alice Liddell, the real life Alice Liddell, this little girl. And that little girl, as we show at the beginning of the, of the story in the frame poem, her and her two sisters, uh, as well as the nanny that was there with them, uh, they really wanted a story full of nonsense. They loved stories that had nonsense in them. But that experience is quite different from being a listener outside of the story where we enjoy that stuff versus being a person who has to actually live in a world of nonsense, in a world of fairy tales. It can be very frustrating for the character in a story. Um, and, and so that that's, I think that's a clear distinction to be drawn here. Uh, that if you actually were inside of these stories, It'd be quite different for you. Uh, but it was very confusing for her in the same way that growing up can be very confusing. It's all a matter of perspective because for the caterpillar, Alice doesn't understand or has trouble understanding. Caterpillar is used to growing up and changing sizes all the time. That's a part of its being, okay? And that's a part of the being a human as well, that you, especially when you're adolescent, that you're growing and changing sizes. And so he says, no, it's not very confusing to do these things. It's natural. She says, won't you turn into a butterfly one day? And he says, no, not a bit, because it's natural to him. Uh, so time and time again, Alice gets in these conversations with uh, characters, and she is unable to see from their perspective how things go or unable to see things differently than what she's used to. And this causes annoyance and anger and the frustration. Uh, but perhaps maybe a lesson to be learned from that is you need to be able to see from different perspectives uh, how things happen. Uh, now at the bottom of page 41, this chapter is called Advice from a Caterpillar. I don't have it circled here, but I have since went back and circled that uh, at the bottom in this, um, in my edition of the book. 
the caterpillar's first advice is to keep your temper. All right. Um, is that all, said Alice, swallowing down her anger as best she could. I think that that, you know, it seems a little buried, but if you dig into that a little bit deeper, I'm trying to draw a contrast between Alice and the Queen of Hearts who, and the Duchess, who are representative, perhaps, of you know, how Alice perceives adult women in Victorian society. They have a lot of trouble in keeping their temper, and that perhaps is one of the ways that Alice can be distinguished between these characters. Uh, she does let anger get control of her sometimes, and when she does, later on, uh, the whole house of cards comes tumbling down, quite literally, and she wakes up from her dream. Um, she thinks that she's changed, and she's right here. Uh, and so the caterpillar says, yo, you think you changed? Then tell me something that you used to know. Tell me this old story. And she tells this old story of old father William. There's lots of poems and stories and songs uh, because children in this time, that's one way in which they entertained themselves. There wasn't an iPad, you know, so they'd sing songs and listen to poems and stories and stuff like that. These were a lot, great deal of fun. Uh, and also in school, they would be taught to recite a lot of these things. Um, <clears throat> and so the caterpillar tells her to repeat this old tale, and she reinvents the tale. She literally turns it, Father William on its head, as you can see in this picture here. The tale becomes quite different in her telling. Uh, and in this edition, you can read the original old Father William. Um, <clears throat> but it's disrespectful in a lot of ways to uh, elderly people, which is what kids are not taught to do in school. Um, <clears throat> it shows her imagination. She's beginning to be imaginative. And be, she's beginning to tell things differently than the way that she's taught. She's starting to become herself uh, is one way to interpret this here. Uh, she's starting to learn to, in a lot of ways, how fun it is to not be obedient. Um, and later on at the end of this work, whenever she disobeys the adults in Wonderland because they're behaving so badly, that's when she gains control of Wonderland. And that's one of her distinct uh, changes. All right, moving on uh, towards page 46, which is also in the same chapter still, even if you're reading online, you can see that. She complains about not being used to all these quick changes here. Uh, and she says, I wish the creatures wouldn't be. And uh, the caterpillar says, you'll get used to it in time. And she does. She does get used to it in time. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a cool little section right here. Uh, one, the caterpillar says, one side of eating this mushroom will make you taller, and the other side will make you grow shorter. There's a famous uh, Jefferson Airplane song called The White Rabbit, which it speaks to this right here, uh, <clears throat> and paraphrases this line and many other lines of the, of the story. Look at Alice. She thinks one side of what will make me taller, one side of what? She doesn't say this out loud, but the caterpillar hears her almost as if he hears her. He says, of the mushroom out loud, just as if she had asked it aloud. So <clears throat> this shows that the caterpillar, and in this world here, he can hear her thoughts. Uh, so it's because the caterpillar is a part of her. She's dreaming this world. This is her world that she dreams. Uh, and the caterpillar is part of her dream, uh, and his altered state of consciousness allows her to hear these things. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Here, again, she has to defend herself uh, that she's a little girl. As she starts eating this mushroom here, she grows super tall, uh, and she gets up into the branches of the trees, and a little pigeon sees her and thinks that she's a snake or a serpent uh, and fears that this serpent or little girl is going to eat her eggs. Um, and she tries to defend herself. Uh, she tries to invent something 
Uh, and she says, I'm a little girl, rather doubtfully. But, you know, as the pigeon says, you look more like a girl because her neck is super long like a snake and kind of going around like this right here, flopping around. Um, <clears throat> so she's having a hard time figuring out who she is again and again. All right, the pig and pepper chapter. Um, <clears throat> this is where she arrives upon the Duchess's house. And we see uh, one of the things uh, that I told you you could write about is how traditional Victorian roles are presented or upended in different ways or mocked. Uh, and here we have the butler and the messenger uh, with the doorman and the messenger uh, and the doorman can't even perform a basic task of letting her inside the door. Uh, the footman says, there might be some sense in your knocking on the door to try to get into the house of the Duchess here if there was a door between us. So he's standing on the wrong side of the door and so she can't get in. Um, <clears throat> She says on page 52, how am I to get in in a louder tone? Are you to get in at all? That's the first question, you know. It was no doubt, only Alice did not like to be told so. It's really dreadful the way all the creatures argue. It's enough to drive one crazy. So, uh, <clears throat> and this is going to be something that we're going to see a lot more going forward. These characters are gradually going to get more crazy and more crazy. Um, So we run into the Duchess right here, and this whole scene right here, as she gets inside of this house, uh, this is the Duchess's house, who's been invited to the Queen's Croquet game. There's pepper all over the place, and it's driving the creatures mad. Uh, they're all sneezing. Affected is the Cheshire Cat. This is where we're first introduced to the Cheshire Cat. Uh, she's sitting in the corner. I mean, and he's got this big smile, um, which is kind of creepy. The Duchess here says, after, you know, Alice says, I didn't know that Cheshire Cats always grin. Uh, and the Duchess says, you don't know much, and that's a fact. Um, Alice finds constantly adults <laughs> acting rudely. Uh, and Alice tries to put these adults in their place. She tries to teach them manners. Uh, so it's ironic that the adults in this world don't have any manners. And I think it kind of uh, indicates that something that Alice is eventually going to learn, you know, adults continuously tell little children that they need to have the right manners, but a lot of times adults don't have any manners at all. My computer is kind of freezing up on me here. So I hope y'all can see me. All right, sorry, I was having some trouble with my computer. Hopefully y'all can hear me now. Um, <clears throat> so the Duchess has a little baby. Now, I told you that a lot of these characters are gonna imitate uh, common Victorian norms. So this duchess is supposed to imitate a mother, right? But she does exactly the opposite of what a mother should do. Like, just like, you know, they're acting rude and an adult should not act rude, right? Uh, so it, it, it kind of indicates that uh, something that Alice is going to eventually learn is, you know, act uh, the way that they teach little children to act. Not all mothers act the way that they should toward their children. Sometimes mothers are rude to their children. Alice is going to learn. Uh, <clears throat> look at this little lullaby that uh, the Duchess sings to her little baby, which we later learn is going to be a little piggy. Oink, oink. Um, speak roughly to your little boy and beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy because he knows it teases. And the book cook and the baby are going wah, 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 uh, as the chorus. It's very funny here. 
Um, Alice feels very badly for the little piggy and is trying to save it before uh, the Duchess kills it. She's worried the Duchess is going to, you know, slaughter this little baby, which, of course, it's a pig. You know, what, what's going to be what's going to be the main course tonight, I wonder, you know? Um, <clears throat> And um, she tries to nurse the little baby. Alice does, uh, and, and the little and the and Alice tries to impose order upon the little baby. She says, "Don't grunt. That's not the proper way of expressing yourself." Uh, but of course, you know, a little baby can't understand what you're saying, and definitely not if it's a little pig. Uh, and it starts turning into a pig, or she starts realizing it's a pig. She says, "If you're going to turn into a pig, I'll have nothing more to do with you." Uh, so Alice isn't doing a very good job of uh, being a mother either. Uh, she doesn't think very well of children. She says uh, she began thinking over other children she knew who might do very well as pigs and was just saying to herself, if one only knew the right way to change them. So uh, she has an attempt at being a mother. It doesn't quite work out because she's far too young. Um, it might not be as pleasurable, I think, uh, as little girls are told to have a little kid, because sometimes they can act like little piggies. Um, so another one of these expectations that she's been taught is upended. She runs into the Cheshire cat up in the tree here, who, as we move through the narrative, is gonna disappear and reappear time and time again. <clears throat> she asks advice from the Cheshire Cat, which way should I go? And he asks, gives nonsensical advice. But one core thing that he teaches her right here, he says, you can visit this person or this person. They're both mad. And Alice says, I don't want to go among mad people. And the cat says, oh, you can't help that. We're all mad here. I'm mad. You're mad. So how do you know I'm mad? Of course, in the sense of being crazy is what he means. Oh, you must be mad or you wouldn't have come here. Uh, so this is, in a lot of ways, this work analyzes you know, what it means to be insane. What is it like to be insane or be hanging out among insane people? It's frustrating uh, to say the least. All right, then we actually go to a mad tea party. So traditionally, Alice has an idea of how a tea party should go. A tea party, in a lot of ways, is supposed to be a respectable event. We're going to have characters or people or uh, with uh, you know, manners. Uh, but is going to upend that notion. You know, sometimes adults act rather rudely and Alice tries to put them in you know into order constantly Alice tries to impose order upon this uh, world that lacks any order at all and, and time and time again it seems to fail uh, until the very end <clears throat> uh, Alice comes in to the mad tea party and she sees uh, a large table with a march hare and the mad hatter and a dormouse fast asleep. Uh, the table's a large one. All three were all crowded together in one corner. And they said, no room. There's no room at this table. And Alice says, there's plenty of room. And she sat down. So it's moments like this where we see Alice is beginning to change. She doesn't really ask permission. She takes charge because she sees that everybody is acting insanely. Once she realizes that everybody's crazy, you know, she is the one who tries to impose order on this place. Uh, they tell a little girl to have some wine, you know, says there isn't any wine. Uh, and and she, she, they say, she says, it wasn't very civil of you to offer wine if there's no wine. So she calls them out on their rudeness. Um, in this uh, party, it should be noted that, that we've got 
think about the little characters that we have. Uh, we, we got a little Dormouse who's sleeping through the whole conversation and being rude in that way. We, we got the Mad Hatter who's being impertinent. Uh, <clears throat> And also, you know, not speaking sens sensibly at all. Uh, it's like he's hardly see speaking English. But then we also have the March Hare, uh, which in March, we got a rabbit who is sex crazed and he is acting in. So Alice doesn't yet understand, you know, what sex can do, what the drive for sex can do to a person. Look at Tennille's illustration. Look at how wide the, the March Hare's eyes are. And what is that? A straw hat on him with just kind of poking out everywhere right there. Uh, <clears throat> and they're all hocked up on tea because it's been six o'clock for a month now uh, and they can't stop drinking tea. So they're all just like <coughs> full of caffeine. It's like, you know, I'm drinking some coffee right now, but imagine if I had, had eight pots today. So they are. Woo! Crazy right now. <clears throat> uh, and there's a question of um, saying what you mean. So there's a, and here we have a conversation about language, right? We're taught that language makes sense, right? We're taught that sentences, because they are sentences, make sense. But here, uh, the Mad Hatter kind of questions whether sentences make sense at all, whether riddles have a solution to them. Uh, we have hmm, a riddle uh, that the Mad Hatter asks her. <clears throat> well, here we, we, we see first off, she says, uh, he says, you should say what you mean, the March Hare says. And Alice says, I do. At least I mean what I say. And that's the same thing. And the Hatter wisely says, that's not the same thing a bit. Well, you might just as well say, I see what I eat. It's the same as I eat what I see. Uh, and the Dormouse says, I breathe when I sleep. It's the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. Um, hmm. There's been a uh, riddle that's been posed uh, here by the Hatter, and it's a riddle that has no answer. Why is a raven like a writing desk? And Alice thinks, oh, this will be fun. Hmm. But there's no answer to this riddle. Uh, and later on, Alice remarks, the Hatter's remarks seem to her to have no sort of meaning, and yet it was certainly English. So um, even though you're talking to somebody who's speaking English, there might not necessarily be meaning in that. Sometimes adults talk nonsense. All right, I'm going to scoot on to the next section here. They consistently be rude to Alice until she can't bear it anymore. On page 67, this piece of rudeness was more than Alice could bear. She got up in great disgust and walked off. The Dormouse fell asleep instantly, and neither of the others took the least notice of her going. As she looked back once or twice. And she resolves that she'll never go there again. Uh, <clears throat> now, let's move on to the Queen's Co Craig Croquet game. Now, this is about page 70, and it's the next chapter. I believe it's chapter 8. Let me make sure I'm right here. Yep. Uh, chapter 8. So we get to the Queen of Hearts, and this is one of the key characters in work here because she's the ruler of this world. Um, she has time and time again, we see the queen of hearts, um, uh, and, uh, she is threatening to behead people all of the time. Uh, we have learned, uh, that she is about to behead somebody, bringing the cook tulip roots instead of onions. And it says right here, Seven flung down his brush and had just begun, well, of all the unjust things. So here we have a curious instance where even the characters of Wonderland begin to question the justice or the sense of some of the actions of things that are happening. 
Uh, these little cards have accidentally painted roses the wrong color, and they're trying to turn them back uh, to the color of red to please the Queen of Hearts. Uh, but she happens up upon them in the middle of their uh, fixing the color of these roses, and well, she is not pleased. Would you tell me, please, said Alice a little timidly, while you're painting those roses? Uh, <clears throat> well, so they made a mistake here. Uh, and then we get the king and queen of hearts. Uh, and she doesn't quite know how to react uh, to them arriving upon the scene. And so even though the gardeners throw themselves upon the ground, she wonders what would be the use of a procession if people had to lie down on their faces. So she just stands there. And the queen is very upset by that. She says, who is this? Um, Idiot, said the queen. What's your name, child? My name is Alice, so please your majesty, very politely. Well, they're only a pack of cards. I needn't be afraid of them. So this is what I'm saying right here. Uh, even though the queen is threatening to behead people all the time, Alice, she's not afraid of them. Uh, because they're only a pack of cards, and this distinguishes her from the other characters in Wonderland. Even though, of course, as you see, the Queen of Hearts in Tennille's illustration looks pretty mean. Image of a matriarchal society. Some people criticize Carol's work because here we have a matriarchal society that's presented as insane, crazy, all of these things. So it could imply that this is what happens when you uh, have a society ruled by a woman who is histrionic. Um, or it could show an adult woman maybe is a distinguish, is something to distinguish between the two. An adult woman of quite a different character than Alice is described toward the end of the work. Uh, as her sister's imagining what Alice is going to grow up to be like. So maybe, maybe Tennille is criticizing the, our society or his society at the time and how the society raises women to be like. That's another way to interpret it. Um, <clears throat> so the queen says, off with her head. The queen says, well, cut off Alice's head. And Alice says, nonsense. So here we got Alice uh, again imposing order upon this world right here. She takes charge of Neverland. She begins to take charge. And as she does that, as we move forward, eventually the House of Cards is going to fall down. Uh, <clears throat> the queen doesn't kill her. The queen doesn't have her head top, chopped off. Look at Alice and how she begins to impose order and justice on this world right here. The queen says, off with the heads of the three cards. And Alice says, you shan't be beheaded. And she puts them in a large flower pot. And the executioners go off to try to find these cards. Um, they can't find them. And the queen asks the executioners, are their heads off? And we see a little clever turn of phrase here from the executioners. Their heads are gone because they can't find their heads, right? Uh, <clears throat> The queen invites her to have a, a game of croquet. And she has trouble uh, playing this game because the pieces are all always moving. There don't seem to be consistent rules. Um, <clears throat> so you could talk about the nature of games and play in this work. Play is a core theme in this work. Um, and you know, if there are no consistent rules, if there's no consistent justice, that makes us feel uneasy in the same way that Alice feels uneasy right here uh, because she hadn't yet any dispute with the queen during the game, but she knew it might happen in any minute. And the queen's just threatening to lop people's heads off all the time. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's important how the characters kind of turn toward Alice to try to save her, save them from the queen. Um, it's like, they, it's almost as if they realize that she represents order. A young child is the one 
who represents order. Um, uh, the Cheshire Cat appears, uh, and the Queen is pretty upset because she can't lop the head off of because the Cheshire Cat only appears with just his head in the sky. She can't lop his head off. She had only one way of settling all difficulties, great or small, off with his head. Her character is consistent, but it's consistently rude and uh, histrionic. Here is uh, on page 76. When the characters are constantly arguing and bickering, they turn to Alice. She was appealed to by all three to settle the question of how to lop off the head of a cat who only has a head and no neck. Um, but they all spoke at once, and so Alice couldn't quite hear them all. So here we have a picture of this going on. Chapter 9, the mock turtle story. Uh, I just draw attention to the first couple of pages of this uh, because we have the Duchess again, and the Duchess is quite changed in this section right here. One reason Alice speculates that she's quite changed, she's not as angry and rude and because there's no pepper in the air anymore. Um, <clears throat> Alice speculates maybe it's the pepper who made her so savage. Uh, another situation might say, well, uh, just like a woman to change at any moment might be one interpretation. Um, <clears throat> Alice is trying to learn the She's constantly trying to learn these rules, but of course the rules of Neverland change all the time. Here we have a little discussion about moralism, and I talked about how in, earlier, how, you know, Dodgson seems to not necessarily like these uh, fairy tales that have morals all the time, that they seem to be boring uh, to Dodgson. And you could connect this to the importance of being earnest in Oscar Wilde. Uh, the Duchess says everything's got a moral if only you can find it. And a lot of people who interpret this work say, well, there's no queer moral at all in this work. Um, <clears throat> and look at the morals that the Duchess tries to draw from uh, what's happening here. Uh, says that the game's going on better, right? The game of croquet is working better. And the Duchess says, oh, the moral of that is tis love that makes the world go around. And then somebody else says, well, it, it's done by everybody minding their own business. Uh, and the Duchess says, well, these two morals are much the same thing, but they're not. Um, and then she says, the moral of that is take care of the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves. And Alice remarks how fond she is of finding morals and things. So. She recognizes it's a fairy tale, so there's got to be a moral in it, right? Uh, but not necessarily. All right, moving on to chapter 11. And I think this is one of the more important chapters in the work, is chapter 11 and uh, chapter 12. Now we're getting on to the last part of the work, and you're going to be reading this over the course of the weekend. You're going to get to the end of Alice in Wonderland. And these two final chapters are the last chapters of the work. Think about what they represent, okay? I've already been kind of building you up to have the Knave of Hearts being on trial for stealing the tarts, and did he or didn't he do it? Uh, <clears throat> Alice finally finds a place where she hopes that she's going to get some sense. Uh, she's, she sees... Uh, Rule of law, a court of law is supposed to, in Victorian England, represent the ultimate justice, the ultimate place of sense and reason. But as we get this place right here, we're going to see this is going to be quite the opposite of what Alice expects. Uh, so how can we get order and justice in this place? It's going to be up to Alice to impose order upon this nonsensical place right here. I'm not going to walk you through this chapter today, first off, because we don't have much time, but secondly, because you haven't read it all. And so I'll let I'll give you the pleasure of reading that chapter. But I want you to pay attention to how Alice is changing and how she's growing up and, and how ultimately this place is this is the climax of the story. OK, how this place just gets completely out of control. 
And I want you to think about this final frame scene right here. I think this is a very important to uh, thinking about the work and I began to read it to you last time, uh, but it's on page 110. The end of the work right here is where Alice's sister, Alice wakes up from the dream of Wonderland and her sister uh, thinks about how Alice is going to, imagines what Alice is gonna be like as she grows up. Alice is going to be a storyteller. It's going to tell these stories to young children. Uh, <clears throat> and, and I think that's very important because we get a picture in this final scene of what Alice is like at eight to what she's going to be like as an adolescent, to what she's going to be like as an old lady and how that contrasts with perhaps the Queen of Hearts and the Duchess and all of these other. All right, my friends, uh, I do.